Good afternoon, everybody. The final talk of our session today will be given by Laura Ruprecht, who works for Zephyr in Los Angeles. She'll be talking about descriptors, so please give her a warm welcome. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Laura Ruprecht, and yes, I'm here to talk about descriptors. Um, so a little bit more about me. I live in LA now. I work at Zephyr. We do a lot of content management for people on YouTube. And I work on a really small team, and we work on the ad tech side. So on the downside, I put a lot of ads on cute cat videos. But on the upside, you can see all of the cute cat videos for free. So pluses and minuses. Um, sometimes I post things on Twitter. Uh, that's how to get in touch. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about what a descriptor actually is, because I don't think there's a lot of stuff out there that really goes over it in a pragmatic way. And to do that, I'm going to go over a custom example and then talk a little bit about the kinds of descriptors that exist in Python and how they're actually used in the standard library, and then touch a little bit on a few examples, so like properties, class methods, um, a little bit of usage in ORM, and then talk about a couple of common problems that you might run into when you're using them. So first things first, what exactly is a descriptor? So it's a certain type of attribute. So here I have some descriptor, and I'm using this as this class attribute on this class foo. And so some descriptor is something that I'm using instead of a, a normal attribute, like instead of a string or a, another random object. Um, and what you define here in that descriptor is as long as you define dunder get, dunder set, and dunder delete, that's how this actually does its magic. So what does that mean? Um, when you write a descriptor, it should look something like this if you write the class. Um, quick note, I'm doing all of my examples in Python 3, so if you're doing Python 2 still in this descriptor class, you'll have to inherit from object or else it won't work. Um, so I have an init function. I, I can pass in a bunch of arguments, keyword arguments, and that sort of defines what I'm doing with this descriptor. And then I have my get method and set and delete, which defines how I'm doing all of my attribute access. So the interesting thing on this dunder get method is that I'm passing in the instance on which I'm using this descriptor, which I'll show an example, so hopefully it's a little bit more clear. And then I pass in the owner, which is pretty much the class of that instance. So I can actually call this directly from the class and have different behavior from if I call this on an instance, which is interesting. Whereas the get and the set, they only really care about the instance and then whatever values you're, you're trying to set on that instance. So. How I got involved in trying to figure out how descriptors work is I deal with a lot of video stuff, and I had to deal with the YouTube API. And it's a lot of JSON, so I have a bunch of dictionary access everywhere in the code. So I'm dealing with stuff like this. So if I want to pull out a URL from, from a response that I get, I have to get the video response. And then I have to pull out the snippet. And then I have to pull out the thumbnails. Then I have to pull out the particular resolution thumbnail that I want. And then I have to pull out the URL. And yeah, it's OK, but it's a real pain to deal with. My IDE doesn't really do any autocomplete for this type of thing, because it's just dictionary access. So my boss at the time, this was when I was working at the Zephyr Boston office. Um, Jonathan Tushman, he came up to me, and he's always excited about everything. So he said, OK, I think I know how to solve this problem, and I think the way to do it is to use descriptors. To which I said, uh, OK, so what's a descriptor? <laughs> what, 
which brought me to that whole thing where I was trying to figure out what it was, which if you look in the official documentation, it's an attribute with some sort of binding behavior, which in retrospect, right, after I've done all of this reading on descriptors, totally makes sense, absolutely makes sense. But when I was first looking at this, it, like what kind of binding behavior? So that's that get, set, and delete that I was talking about. So forget that, let's just look at this lovely <laughs> response that I get back from YouTube. And this isn't even if I pull out all of the fields that I can pull out. Um, so that's my lovely dictionary access. It's kind of annoying. And I'm not even using most of this. So most of this I'm just gonna ignore. So I'm dealing with it like this. But how can I make this a little bit prettier to deal with? And so first try is take this and put it into an object. I have this response. It'd be nice to package that up somehow. So I do all of that same dictionary access and I put in all of the responses and I pull out all of the fields in my init function. The only problem here is if I update any of this stuff, I have to do it explicitly because once I set these things on self, it, it won't automatically update. So if the response changes, I can't just update the response on the object and then have that sort of bubble up to all of those attributes. So, okay, it's a little bit better. This, just for the sake of convenience, I figured I'd use a dictionary digger module, which you'll see why I'm doing this in a little bit. It, it lets you pass in a bunch of uh, path arguments and then it uses that to pull out all of those JSON responses. But this still has the same problem as that last example, which is namely that I have this JSON response and it, if I update the JSON response, that JSON response will be out of sync with all of these attributes that I have in that instance. So, still repetitive. Now we bring in the magic. So, I have a descriptor now, right? And this is the cool thing. So, I have a JSON response in my YouTube response class, or in, in an instance of my YouTube response class. And then if you notice the YouTube ID and the title and the views and the description, I'm just using a descriptor for that. So what this descriptor is actually doing is I initialize it and this gets executed when, when I first create this class and I'm specifying the rules for pulling out these attributes. So instead of setting something to self in an init function, I'm saying, so this is my descriptor when I do a get operation. So instance of YouTube response dot views, go to this get function, pass in that instance that I have, and then pass in the class, and then pull out whatever is the path for getting that JSON response out. And I set up the path, that's the first thing that happens when this class is created. So just for completeness, I figure it adds some error checking. So if I run into an index error or a key error, give back a more useful error. So give back an attribute error because that's what you'd expect in this case. And then I still have the YouTube response as before. So it's a lot easier to deal with. And then I can pull out the title really easily and I can rickroll everybody. So now I didn't explain everything though. So there's two types of descriptors. <laughs> there's a data descriptor where you define a get and then you define a set and or delete. And then there's a non-data descriptor where you just define a get function. So like, why, why do I have these? So when I look up an attribute, 
Python is dictionaries all the way down. If you talk to anyone, they say, yeah, everything in Python is a dictionary. So what happens when I look up foo.x is I look in that instance dictionary, and then I pull out x, and I get whatever I put in there. Eh, kind of, right? Like, this entire talk is, yeah, that's how it works, but it actually works like this. So when I look for foo.x, I'm breaking it up into four steps, right? So first, I check the class dictionary for a data descriptor. So it has to have a set or delete in addition to a, a get method defined. So first, I check there. If there's a non-data descriptor or if there's just a, a normal attribute, don't care. Skip it. If I don't find that, then I check the instance dictionary. And that's sort of the normal Python access that you're looking for. If I don't find that, then I look on the class again for a non-data descriptor or just a class attribute. Or if I don't find anything, throw an attribute error. And remember, this also goes for everything in the method resolution order. If you don't find anything in that, in that class. So why on earth is this split up? It's a way to have function or method access fit in a little bit better with attribute access in general. So when you call a function, you call instance.f of x. Then you check that class dictionary for a data descriptor. You don't usually find one of those for a normal method call, so then you check the instance dictionary of whatever you're calling this on for any kind of attribute. Don't usually find that, so then you go and you find a non-data descriptor back in the class, in the class dictionary, and then you pull out that specific function with the instance and the owner using that get descriptor method. And then you have the function. And so that self, which is usually your first, your first argument, that's what you more or less pass into that function. So in this whole line of, of um, looking up an attribute, when you have a function, you're doing this third step. So now that we've gone over that, property and class method, they get used a lot. And a lot of the times, people don't know why they work, but they do. And it's magic, and it's really nice. And for intro to programming, it's, it's a pretty neat way to get descriptor functionality without having to do all of these um, setting everything up yourself. So when you have something set up as a property, you actually transform something with this decorator from something like, like um, a property def bar return whatever the answer is into this property like thing. So you'll notice if you're familiar with the way properties work, you can actually do something like bar dot setter or bar dot deleter, and then that will more or less add those functions to this bar property. But most of the time I see this, people just have a single property. So they just define the getter. And you can define documentation, too, which is kind of neat. Um, so that's essentially what this gets transformed into. Now, when I use this like this, it's really nice because I get to treat it sort of as an attribute. So if it's something that has to be computed on the fly, I can use it that way. But you have to remember, even if you don't set the the um, set method or the delete method, this is always a data descriptor, so it'll always take precedence in that order I showed earlier. On the other hand, class method transforms your code from something like this into this special class method attribute. And the way you use that is you call it either on an instance or you can call it on the class itself. And this is also a non-data descriptor. 
And I'm not going to go over static method, but that's similar. So in ORMs, now that you've seen a lot of these in, in the earlier portions of this talk, you'll notice that I have this car field and this date field. And those are descriptors, right? Because the name and the birth date, those are defined on this person class. So I have these attributes that are set on the class, and I'm using them to define how I'm getting things out of an instance of that class. It's a little roundabout, but I can do stuff that's cool like this, like setting a maximum length on a, on a field. And use that just however I'd normally use it in Django, and I can do some crazy validation. And it'll tell me, no, this doesn't work. <laughs> so why, why would you want to do this? Because like, these are super complicated. Um, so a lot of this validation, I see a lot of this for uh, converting units. If you're doing a lot of getting and setting, and let's say you want to store everything on the back end in metric, but you have some crazy US people who want to use imperial units, uh, you, can use, you can make it easier to manipulate those fields, and you don't have to worry about your different, your different attributes on your instances becoming out of sync. Why not to use this? Because it looks awesome. Job security. <laughs> um, although, in hindsight, those might be why you should use descriptors. So, again, pluses and minuses. Um, and because you're setting all of this stuff up yourself, you should definitely think about including some other error checking just so that when people use this stuff, when they hit an exception for some reason, they know why they're getting that exception. So if you decide you don't want to implement something, add a not implemented error. Or if you don't want an attribute to exist on a certain class or on a certain instance, then you can raise that. Now, last things is it's really easy to mess this stuff up, especially if you're used to using sort of normal Python classes and not descriptors. So what I'm doing here is I'm initializing some value on a descriptor to none. I have an, a get method, and I return the value. I let you set the value. Problem here is like this this is normal Python code, right? You can execute it, it does stuff. But if I make thing one that's an instance of that class and I set an attribute on say X, whatever is um, this descriptor, I essentially set that as a class attribute because I make another instance of that class and then I print out thing 2.x, and I get what I put into the first one. Why is that? Because I have one instance of this descriptor defining that x field, and I'm storing that hello world. I'm storing that on that descriptor, which is why I'm getting it back when I have thing 2.x. Another thing to look out for uh, is infinite recursion. Don't use your get functions to, to do a get adder, because that will just call your get function again. <laughs> now, a way to deal with this, there's a few good ways, is you're not really using that instance dictionary. So why not just store the stuff there? Um, throw in some error checking. And then I can even include a setter. So use that instance dictionary. And then another thing to note is this set. right? If I don't include this set, then I have a non-data descriptor, which means that that instance dictionary item, like that uh, attribute will be returned from that instance dictionary because it will take precedence over that get method. But if I do have it, then I'm just returning whatever is in that dictionary. So there isn't 
too much really awesome stuff out there on descriptors, but there are a few really good things. So demystifying descriptors in five minutes by Chris Beaumont with a really snazzy IPython notebook, that's a good one. Um, it's five minutes, super nice. I really like David Beasley's Python 3 metaprogramming tutorial. Unfortunately, it's like three hours long. It's a three hours that I would definitely recommend though, really good. Um, on the shorter side of things again is Simeon Franklin has a really good 30 minute presentation on Python descriptors. And he does a really good job of going through all of the Python attribute access. And then tried and true Raymond Hedinger's descriptor how-to guide. For that one, I definitely recommend reading it and then going and doing some other reading and then coming back to it. And when you come back to it, there will be so much stuff that just didn't really sink in before, but becomes really clear later. And then also the inside story on new style classes. Also really good, he goes into a lot of uh, why methods work the way they do and how they're sort of wrapped in, in order to have an instance, be able to call a method on it, and then have that call a function with your instance as, as the first argument automatically. So these are all really good. Um, I'll post the slides so you can pull those out. Um, slides are there at Pi Descriptors, and you can contact me that way. So thanks. If you have any questions, I'd love to answer them. <laughs> Thanks for your talk. Um, I got a Rick roll by the, uh, the slide. I didn't have time to look at the code. Can you go back into the slide, please? Which one? The Rick roll one, the, um, when you, had, you got the attributes, um, the final solution for the uh, attribute for the YouTube. Hmm. Um, yeah, that one. This one? No, previous, the, 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 the big. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I got distracted by the, the image. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's beautiful. I actually did pull this out using the YouTube API to get the maximum resolution URL. <laughs> Hi, I actually have a question about the next slide. Uh, this. Uh, next one. The next, next one. Uh, this one, yes. yes. Uh, you say that there's a difference between step one and step three, and I don't really see it. You say type foo, and we're checking for data descriptor, and then we're checking for non-data descriptor, but looking at the code, I can't tell oh. the difference. OK, so this looks in the same place. So in both of those steps, you look at the class of whatever instance you have, and then you look in the class dictionary, and then you look at whatever x in this case. Um, the difference is that in step one, you're, you're explicitly checking for something that has um, a set or delete. And, and the Python interpreter looks for this. And if you have something that doesn't have set or delete, but just has a get, that's sort of termed as a, a non-data descriptor and then you don't pull that out until the third step here. So if, it, if you have a set or delete along with your get, you'll hit step one when you pull out um, that attribute. Otherwise, you'll, you'll go through these other steps. And the reason they did this was so that you could have function calls, or, or method calls, rather, and those usually are found in this third step because they're like you have a function that's sort of wrapped in a non-data descriptor so that you can pass in that instance as a first argument when you're calling that function. But um, you can actually override that call on the instance itself because if you put something into that instance dictionary, when you go to call that function, it'll, it'll hit that second step first, or second. 
functions. It'll so, hit it before the third step, and that's what's important. So when it comes to functions, would they be considered data descriptors or non-data descriptors? Non-data descriptors. Thanks. You actually just answered my question with that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, two for one. Okay, thank you very much, Laura. All right. Thank you.